As long as science fails to discover the sources of life, as long as on sea or in the sky there is an abyss that is resistant to mathematical reckoning, as long as mankind in its steady progress is ignorant of where it is heading, as long as a mystery exists for man, there will be poetry. Good evening, friends, and welcome once again to Storytime for Adults. Stories post the fourth Monday of every month. Well, it's the end of September, and technically summer ended here in Oklahoma last week. Of course, this being the Midwest, the weather has not managed to get the memo yet. So, this month we're going to get back a bit to our unofficial theme for this year and have a monthly tie-in. Ah, so what's our tie-in this month? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, September 15th through October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month. And so we'll be reading an important and well-known Hispanic author. So, who are we reading then? A Spanish romantic poet, playwright, literary columnist, and writer, Gustavo Adolfo Becker, is today considered to be one of the most important writers in Spanish literature, and the second most read Spanish writer only to Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote. I should know before I go on any farther, I'm going to be pronouncing a large number of Spanish names. I will inevitably stumble on one of the pronunciations. I beg your indulgence. I'm doing my best here, guys. So, Gustavo Adolfo Dominguez Bastida was born February 17, 1836, in Sevilla, Spain, to Jose Dominguez Baquer and Joaquina Bastida de Vargas. Gustavo's father was a well-known and liked local painter from a family of originally Flemish ancestry who'd been a resident in Sevilla since the 16th century or so. Because of this positive reputation, Gustavo and his older brother Valeriano would both eventually adopt their father's second last name of Becker for the recognition that it brought. The young Gustavo appears to have had a talent for sketching and drawing from a very early age and received instruction along with his brother in his first few years from his father. His penchant for drawing and painting stuck with Gustavo as a hobby, if not a primary passion for his entire life. And Gustavo both lost both of his parents at an early age. His father died when he was just five years old, and his mother passed away when he was nine, leaving Gustavo and his siblings orphaned. At a couple of different periods in his young life, Gustavo lived with his uncle, Don Juan de Vargas, but also, importantly, spent many years living with his baptismal godmother, Lady Donna Manuela Monaje. During his life, he was educated at San Antonio Abad School and the San Telmo School, a nautical institution. While at San Telmo, Gustavo first began to truly discover and explore his literary talents and interests, along with his friend Narciso Campillo. But it was perhaps the years that he lived with his godmother that were some of the most formative. Lady Donna Manuela was a well-to-do lady of Sevilla, but also a very well-educated one who actively encouraged Gustavo's artistic and literary interests. Perhaps more importantly, Lady Donna possessed an extensive library, which she not only gave Gustavo free access to, but that she enthusiastically guided him through. During this period of his life, it was said that he scarcely left home, so engrossed was he in literature. As befit her intelligence, though, and the seriousness with which she took her duty as a godmother, Lady Donna also needed him to have a profession to carry himself forward. Never underestimate the wisdom of godmothers. With that in mind, Lady Donna managed to secure admittance for Gustavo to become a pupil in the studio of the famous Spanish painter Don Antonio Gabral Bejarano at the Santa Isabella de Hungria School in 1850. As an aside, Don Antonio would serve as the very first director of the Museum of Fine Arts of Sevilla. This museum is significant for the vast number of for a vast number of reasons, but as it relates to our story tonight, it's significant as the repository of the most famous and notable portrait of Gustavo Adolfo Becker that we happen to have. Now, if you were to Google the name, or Google his name, the oil painting that you will see in almost every image hit for his name is the painting that we're talking about here. And this portrait was painted by Becker's older brother, Valeriano. Now, after two years with Don Antonio, Gustavo moved to work and study at his uncle Joaquin's studio, and it was here that Gustavo and his older brother Valeriano were reunited for the first times since shortly after their mother's death. At this time, Gustavo would also have been 16 years old and his brother Valeriano roughly 19. 
During this time, uh, Gustavo and his brother Valeriano became very close and stayed that way for the rest of their lives. Then in 1853, at the encouragement of his uncle Joaquin, Gustavo would eventually move to Madrid to pursue a career in writing over the very strong objections of his godmother, Dona Manuela. Becker would go on to have several abortive attempts at becoming a professional writer, along with moves to Toledo and then back to Madrid. During the period from 1854 until 1860, he would work as a newspaper writer and an author of comic plays, sometimes in collaboration with a poet and friend, Luis Garcia Luna. In 1861, he would meet and marry Casta Esteban Navarro, with whom he had three children, Gregorio Gustavo Adolfo, Jorge, and Emilio Eusebio. During the period from 1860 until his death in 1870, he would hold a number of government posts on and off, as well as contribute to the literary sections of several local newspapers. He would publish a small amount of his own work during his lifetime, including the History of Spain's Temples, uh, and the Books of Poems of Rimas, and the Book of the Sparrows. Eventually, Gustavo's brother Valeriano would fall ill in September of 1870 and die. This threw Gustavo, who had been very close to his brother and collaborator, and collaborated with him often, into a very deep depression. As was more often the case at the time, this depression itself led to illness, and within three months, on December 22nd of 1870, Gustavo Adolfo Becker died. It was widely reported at the time, and by his friends and family, he died of pulmonary tuberculosis, which was an extremely common illness at the time, and even more so in Madrid. You may recall this is not the first author that we've had who ultimately either succumbed to tuberculosis or had an immediate family member who did. Tuberculosis was also at the time commonly referred to as the romantic sickness or disease. Some of his last words to his friends are reported to have been, remember, don't forget my children. At the time of his death, he was 34 years old. Accordingly, after his death, several of his close friends and literary acquaintances made several compilations of his works, both poems and short stories and published them, at least partially, to help provide income for his widow and children. I mentioned above that Becker is considered to have fallen into the Romantic school of poetry, but that's only half the story. Much of his work is also classified as belonging to the post-Romantic period, and his own use of vocabulary in the lyrics is quite different from what was typical in his native Andalusia at the time. And these qualities are part of what set him apart. He was a man who bridged two distinctly different branches of the arts, painting and writing and also bridged two of the most historic literary movements of his own time, Romanticism and Post-Romanticism. So, let's stop prattling on a bit and get to reading, shall we? Though he was a poet, and he was also an author of short stories, and so this evening we'll be reading one of those. Tonight we'll be reading Maisa Perez, The Organist. Uh, and again, I, undoubtedly I'm going to mispronounce a name somewhere, and so I, I beg your indulgence. Maisa Perez, The Organist, by Gustavo Adolfo Becker. Do you see that man with the scarlet cloak and the white plume in his hat, and the gold embroidered vest? I mean, the one just getting out of his litter and going to greet that lady, the one coming along after those four pages who are carrying torches? Well, that is the Marquis of Mascoso, lover of the widow, the Countess of Pineda. They say that before he began paying court to her, he'd sought the hand of a very wealthy man's daughter. But the girl's father, who they say is a trifle close-fisted. Mm, but hush, speaking of the devil, do you see that man closely wrapped in his cloak coming on foot under the arch of San Felipe? Well, he's the father in question. Everybody in Sevilla knows him on account of his immense fortune. Look, look at that group of stately men. They are the 24 knights. Aha! <clears throat> there is that hemming too. They say that the gentlemen of the Green Cross have not challenged him yet, thanks to his influence with the Great Ones in Madrid. All he comes to church for us to hear, to hear the music. Alas, neighbor, that looks bad. I fear there's going to be a scuffle. I shall take refuge in the church, for according to my guess, there will be more blows than paternosters. Look, look, the Duke of Alcala's people are coming around the corner of St. Peter's Square, and I think I see the Duke of Mendicindonia's men in Dunas Alley. Did I tell you? There, there, the blows are beginning. Neighbor, neighbor, this way before they close the doors. What's that? They've left off. What's that light? Torches, a litter. It's the bishop himself. God preserve him in his office, as many centuries as I desire to live myself. 
If it were not for him, half Seville would have burned up by this time with these quarrels with the dukes. Look at them, look at them, the hypocrites. How they both press forward to kiss the bishop's ring. But come, neighbor, come into the church before it is packed full. Some nights like this, it is so crowded that you could not get in if you were no larger than a grain of wheat. The nuns have a prize in their organist. Other sisterhoods have made Maisa Perez magnificent offers. Nothing strange about that, though, for the very archbishop has offered him mountains of gold if he would go to the cathedral, but he would not listen to them. He would sooner die than give up his beloved organ. You don't know Maisa Perez? Oh, I forgot. You just come into the neighborhood. Well, he's a holy man. Poor, to be sure, but as charitable as any man that ever lived. With no relative but a daughter, and no friend but his organ. He spends all his time in caring for the one and repairing the other. The organ is old, an old affair, you must know. But that makes no difference to him. He handles it so that its tone is a wonder. How he does know it. And all by touch, too. For did I tell you that the poor man was born blind? A humble, too, as the very stones. He always says that he's the only poor convent organist, when the fact is he could give lessons in solfa to the very cathedral master of the primate. You see, he began before he had teeth. His father had the same position before him, and as the boy showed such talent, it was very natural that he should succeed his father when the latter died. And what a touch he has. Bless him. He always plays well, always. But a night like this... He is wonderful. He has the greatest devotion to the Christmas Eve Mass. And when the host is elevated, precisely at twelve o'clock, which is the time that our Lord came into the world, his organ sounds like the voices of angels. But why need I try to tell you about what you are going to hear tonight? It is enough for you to see that all the elegance of Sevilla, the very archbishop included, comes to a humble convent to listen to him. And it is not only the learned people who can understand his skill that come. The common people, too, swarm to the church and are still as the dead when Maisa Perez puts his hand to the organ. And when the host is elevated, when the host is elevated, then you can't hear a fly. Great tears fall from every eye, and when the music is over, a long-drawn sigh is heard, showing how the people have been holding their breath all through. But come, come, the bells have stopped ringing, and the mass is going to begin. Hurry in, this is Christmas Eve for everybody, but for no one is it a greater occasion than for us. So saying, the good woman who'd been acting as Cicerone for her neighbor pressed through the portico of the convent of Santa Inez and elbowed this one and pushed the other, succeeding in getting into the church, forced her way through the multitude that was crowded about the door. Two. The church was profusely lighted. The flood of light which fell from the altars glanced from the rich jewels of the great ladies, who, kneeling upon velvet cushions placed before them by pages, and taking their prayer books from the hands of female attendants, formed a brilliant circle around the chancel lattice. Standing next to that lattice, wrapped in their richly colored and embroidered cloaks, letting their green and red orders be seen with studied carelessness holding in one hand their hats, the plumes sweeping the floor, and letting the other rest upon the polished hilts of rapiers or the jeweled handles of daggers. The 24 knights and a large part of the highest nobility of Sevilla seem to be forming a wall for the purpose of keeping their wives and daughters from contact with the populace. The latter swaying back and forth at the rear of the nave with a noise like that of a rising surf broke out into joyous acclamations as the archbishop was seen to come in. That dignitary seated himself near the high altar under a scarlet canopy, surrounded by his attendants, and three times blessed the people. It was time for the mass to begin. Nevertheless, several minutes passed before the celebrant appeared. The multitude commenced to murmur impatiently. The knights exchanged words with each other in a low tone, and the archbishop sent one of his attendants to the sacristan to inquire why the ceremony did not begin. Maisa Perez has fallen sick, very sick, and it would be impossible for him to come to the midnight mass. This was the word brought back by the attendant. The news ran instantly through the crowd. 
The disturbance caused by it was so great that the chief judge rose to his feet, and the officers came into the church to enforce silence. Just then, a man of unpleasant face, thin, bony, and cross-eyed too, pushed up to the place where the archbishop was sitting. Maisa Perez is sick, he said. The ceremony cannot begin. If you see fit, I will play the organ in his absence. Maisa Perez is not the best organist in the world, nor need this instrument be left unused after his death, for lack of anyone able to play it. The archbishop nodded his head in assent, although some of the faithful who had already recognized in that strange person an envious rival of the organist of Santa Inez were breaking out in cries of displeasure. Suddenly, a surprising noise was heard in the portico. Maisa Perez is here! Maisa Perez is here! At this shout, coming from those jammed in by the door, everyone looked around. Maisa Perez, pale and feeble, was in fact entering the church, brought in a chair, which all were quarreling for the honor of carrying upon their shoulders. The commands of the physicians, the tears of his daughter, nothing had been able to keep him in bed. No, he'd said, this is the last one, I know it. I know it, and I do not want to die without visiting my organ again. This night above all, this Christmas Eve, come, I desire it, I order it, come to the church. His desire had been granted. The people carried him in their arms to the organ loft. The mass began. Twelve struck on the cathedral clock. The introit came, and the gospel, then the <clears throat> offertory, and the moment arrived when the priest, after consecrating the sacred wafer, took it in his hands and began to elevate it. A cloud of incense filled the church in bluish, undulations. The little bells rang out in vibrant peals, and Maisa Perez placed his aged fingers upon the organ keys. The multitudinous voices of the metal tubes gave forth a prolonged and majestic chord, which died away little by little, as if a gentle breeze had borne away its last echoes. At this opening burst, which seemed like a voice lifted up to heaven from earth, responded a sweet and distant note which went on swelling and swelling in volume until it became a torrent of overpowering harmony. It was the voice of the angels, transversing space and reaching the world. Then distant hymns began to be heard, intoned by the hierarchies of seraphim, a thousand hymns at once mingling to form a single one, though this one was only an accompaniment to a strange melody which seemed to float above that ocean of mysterious echoes a strip of fog above the waves of the sea. One song after another died away. The movement grew simpler. Now only two voices were heard, whose echoes blended. Then, but one remained, and alone sustained a note as brilliant as a thread of light. The priest bowed his face, and above his gray head appeared the host. At that moment, the note which Maisa Perez was holding began to swell and swell, and an explosion of unspeakable joy filled the church. From each of the notes formed that magnificent chord, a theme was developed, and some near, others far away, these brilliant, those muffled. One would have said that the waters and the birds, the breezes and the forests, men and angels, earth and heaven were singing, each in its own language, a hymn in praise of the Savior's birth. The people listened, amazed and breathless. The officiating priest felt his hands trembling, for it seemed as if he'd seen the heavens opened and the host transfigured. The organ kept on, but its voice sank away gradually, like a tone going from echo to echo and dying as it goes. Suddenly a cry was heard in the organ loft, a piercing, shrill cry, the cry of a woman. The organ gave a strange, discordant sound, like a sob, and then was silent. The multitude flocked to the stairs leading up to the organ loft, towards which the anxious gaze of the faithful was turned. What has happened? What is the matter? One asked the other, and no one knew what to reply. The confusion increased. The excitement threatened to disturb the good order and decorum fitting within a church. What was that? asked the great ladies of the chief judge, who had been one of the first to ascend to the organ loft. Now, 
pale and displaying signs of deep grief. He was going to the Archbishop, who was anxious, like everybody else, to know the cause of the disturbance. What's the matter? M Maisa Perez has just expired. In fact, when the first of the faithful rushed up the stairway and reached the organ loft, they saw the poor organist fall and face down upon the keys of his old instrument, which was still vibrating, while his daughter, kneeling at his feet, was vainly calling to him with tears and sobs. Three. Good evening, my dear Donna Balthasara. Are you also going tonight to the Christmas at Eve Mass? For my part, I was intending to go to the parish church to hear it, but what has happened? Where is Vicente going, do you, do you ask? Why, where the crowd goes. And I must say, to tell the truth, that ever since poor Maisa Perez died, it seems as if a marble slab was on my heart whenever I go to Santa Inez. Poor dear man, he was a saint. I know one thing. I keep a piece of his cloak as a relic, and he deserves it. I solemnly believe that if the Archbishop would stir in the matter, our grandchildren would see his image among the saints the, on the altars. But of course, he won't do that. The dead and absent have no friends, as they say. It's all the latest thing nowadays, you understand me. What, do you not know what happened? Well, it's true you are not exactly in our situation. From our house to the church and from the church to our house, a word here and another one there, on the wing, without any curiosity whatsoever, I easily find out all the news. Well then, it's a settled thing that the organist of San Roman, that's Squinti, who's always slandering other organists, that great blunderer who seems more like a butcher than a master of solfa, is going to play this Christmas Eve in Maisa Perez's old place. Of course, you know, for everybody knows it, and it is a public matter in Sevilla that no one dared to try it. His daughter would not, though she is a professor of music herself, and her father's death went into the convent as a novice. Her unwillingness to play was the most natural thing in the world. Accustomed as she was to those marvelous performances, any other playing must have appeared bad to her, not to speak of her desire to avoid comparisons. But when the sisterhood had already decided that in honor of the dead organist, and as a token of respect to his memory, the organ should not be played tonight, here comes this fellow along and says that he is ready to play it. Ignorance is the boldest of all things, it is true. The fault is not his, as so much as theirs who have consented to these profanations. But that is the way of the world. But I say, there's no small bit of people coming. No one would say that nothing has changed since last year. The same distinguished persons, the same elegant costumes, the crowding at the door, the same excitement in the portico, the same throng in the church. Alas, if the dead man were to rise, he would feel like dying again to hear his organ played by inferior hands. The fact is, if what the people of the neighborhood tell me is true, they're getting a fine reception ready for the intruder. When the time comes for him to touch the keys, there's going to break out a racket made by timbrels, drums, and horse fiddles, so that you can't hear anything else. But hush, there's the hero of the occasion going into the church. Goodness, what gaudy clothes, what a neckcloth, what a high and mighty air. Come, hurry up. The Archbishop came only a minute ago, and the mess is going to begin. Come on, I guess this night will give us something to talk about for many a day. Saying this, the worthy woman, whom the reader recognizes by her abrupt talkativeness, went into the church of Santa Inez, Santa Inez opening for herself a path in her usual way by shoveling, shoving and elbowing through the crowd. The ceremony had already begun. The church was as brilliant as the year before. The new organist, after passing between the rows of the faithful in the nave and going to kiss the archbishop's ring, had gone to the organ loft, where he was trying one stop of the organ after another with an affected and ridiculous gravity. A low, confused noise was heard coming from the common people clustered at the rear of the church, a sure augury of the coming storm, which would not be long in breaking. He's a mere clown, said some, who does not know how to do anything, and not even look straight. He is an ignoramus, some others, 
who, after having made a perfect rattle out of the organ in his own church, comes here to profane Mesa Perez's. And while one was taking off his cloak, so as to be ready to beat his drum to good advantage, and another was testing his timbrel, and all were more and more buzzing out in talk, only here and there could be found to defend even that curious person, whose proud and pedantic bearing so strongly contrasted with the modest appearance and kind affability of Maisa Perez. At last, the looked-for moment arrived, when the priest, after bowing low and murmuring the sacred words, took the host in his hands. The bells gave forth a peal like a rain of crystal notes. The transparent waves of incense rose and the organ sounded. But its first chord was drowned by a horrible clamor which filled the whole church. Bagpipes, horns, timbrels, drums, Every instrument known to the populace lifted up their discordant voices all at once. The confusion and clangor lasted but a few seconds. As the noises began, so they ended altogether. The second chord, full, bold, magnificent, sustained itself, pouring from the organ's metal tubes like a cascade of inexhaustible and sonorous harmony. Celestial songs like those that caress the ears in moments of ecstasy, Songs which the soul perceives, but which the lip cannot repeat. Single notes of a distant melody, which sound at intervals borne on the breeze. The rustle of leaves kissing each other on the trees, the murmur like rain. Trills of larks, which rise with quivering songs from among the flowers like a flight of arrows to the sky. Nameless sounds, overwhelming as the roar of a tempest. Fluttering hymns which seemed to be mounting to the throne of the Lord like a mixture of light and sound. All were expressed by the organ's hundred voices. With more vigor, more subtle poetry, more weird coloring than had ever been known before. When the organist came down from the loft, the crowd which pressed up to the stairway was so great, and their eagerness to see and greet him so intense, that the chief judge, fearing, and not without reason, that he would be suffocated among them all, ordered some of the officers to open a path for the organist, with their staves of office, so that he could reach the high altar where the prelate was waiting for him. You perceive, said the archbishop, that I have come all the way from my palace to hear you. Now, are you going to be as cruel as my Perez? He would never save me the journey by going to play the Christmas Eve Mass in the cathedral. Next year, replied the organist, I promise to give you the pleasure since for all the gold in the world I would never play this organ again. But why not? interrupted the prelate. Because, returned the organist, endeavoring to repress the agitation which revealed itself in the pallor of his face, because it is so old and poor, one cannot express oneself on it satisfactorily. The archbishop withdrew, followed by his attendants. One after another, the litters of the great folk disappeared in the windings of the neighboring streets. The group in the portico was scattered. The sexton was locking up the doors when two women were perceived, who had stopped to cross themselves and mutter a prayer, and who were now going on their way into Dunas Alley. <clears throat> what would you have, my dear Donna Baltasara? One was saying. That's the way I am, every crazy person with his whim. The barefooted capuchins might assure me that it was so, and I would not believe it. That man never played what we have heard why, I've heard him a thousand times in San Bart Bartolome, his parish church. The priest had to send him away, he was so poor a player. You felt like plugging your ears with cotton. Why, all you need is to look at his face, and that is the mirror of the soul, they say. I remember, as if I was seeing him now. Poor man. I remember Mesa Perez's face nights like this, when he came down from the organ loft, after having entranced the audience with his splendors. What a gracious smile. What a happy glow on his face. Old as he was, he seemed like an angel. But this creature came plunging down as if a dog were barking at him on the landing, and all the color of a dead man. While well, his... Come, dear Dona, Bas Dona Baltasara, believe me, and believe what I say. There's some great mystery about this. Thus conversing, the two women turned the corner of the alley and disappeared. There's no need of saying who one of them was.
4. Another year had gone by. The abbess of the convent of Santa Inez and Mesa Perez's daughter were talking in a low voice, half hidden in the shadows of the church choir. <clears throat> the penetrating voice of the bell was summoning the faithful. The very few people were passing through the portico, silent and deserted, this year, and after taking holy water at the door, were choosing seats in the corner of the nave, where a handful of residents of the neighborhood were quietly waiting for the Christmas Eve Mass to begin. There, you see, the Mother Superior was saying, your fear is entirely childish. There is no one in the church. Well, Sevilla is trooping to the cathedral tonight. Play the organ and do it without any distrust whatsoever. We are only a sisterhood here. <clears throat> but why don't you speak? What has happened? What is the matter with you? I'm afraid, replied the girl in a tone of the deepest agitation. Afraid of what? I do not know. Something supernatural. Listen to what happened last night. I had heard you say that you were anxious for me to play the organ for the mass. I was proud of the honor, and I thought I would arrange the stops and get the organ in good tune so as to give you a surprise today. Alone, I went into the choir and opened the door leading to the organ loft. The cathedral clock was striking just then. I do not know what hour, but the strokes of the bell were very mournful, and they were very numerous, going on sounding for a century, as it seemed to me, while I stood as if nailed to the threshold. The church was empty and dark, but far away there gleamed a feeble light, like a faint star in the sky. It was the lamp burning on the high altar. By its flickering light, which only helped to make the deep horror of the shadows the more intense, I saw... I saw... Mother, do not disbelieve me. A man, in perfect silence, and his back turned towards me. He was running over the organ keys with one hand while managing the stops with the other. And the organ sounded, but in an indescribable manner. It seemed as if each note were a sob smothered in the metal tube, which vibrated under the pressure of the air compressed within it, and gave forth a low, almost imperceptible tone, yet exact and true. The cathedral clock kept on striking, and that man kept on running over the keys. I could hear his very breathing. Fright had frozen the blood in my veins. My body was as cold as ice, except my head and that was burning. I tried to cry out, but I could not. That man turned his face and looked at me. No, he did not look at me, for he was blind. It was my father. Nonsense, sister. Banish these fancies with which the adversary endeavors to overturn weak imaginations. Address a paternoster and an Ave Maria to the Archangel St. Michael, the captain of the celestial hosts, that he may aid you in opposing evil spirits. Wear on your neck a scapulary, which has been pressed to the relics of St. Pacomio, the counselor against temptations, and go, go quickly, and sit at the organ. The Mass is going to begin, and the faithful are growing impatient. Your father is in heaven, and thence, instead of giving you a fright, would ascend to inspire his daughter in the solemn service. The prioress went to occupy her seat in the choir in the midst of the sisterhood. My suppressed daughter opened the door to the organ loft with trembling hand, sat down at the organ, and the mass began. The mass began and went on without anything unusual happening until the time of consecration came. Then the organ sounded. At the same time came a scream from Maisa Perez's daughter. The mother superior, the nuns, and some of the faithful rushed up to the organ loft. Look at him! Look at him! cried the girl fixing her eyes, starting from their sockets upon the seat from which she'd risen in terror. She was clinging with convulsed hands to the railing of the organ loft. Everybody looked intently at the spot to which she directed her gaze. No one was at the organ, yet it went on sounding, sounding like the songs of the archangels in their bursts of mystic ecstasy. Didn't I tell you a thousand times if I did once, dear Donna Baltasara, didn't I tell you? There is some great mystery about this. What? Didn't you go last night to the Christmas Eve Mass? Well, you must know, anyhow, what happened. Nothing else is talked about in the whole city. The Archbishop is furious, and no wonder. Not to have gone to Santa Inez, not to have been present at the miracle, and all to hear a wretched clatter. That's all the inspired organist of San Bartolopea made in the cathedral, so persons who heard him tell me. Yes, I said so all the time. The squint eye never could have played that. 
It was all a lie. There's some great mystery here. What do I think it was? Why, I think it was the soul of Maisa Perez. So, that is the end of our story. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for Storytime for Adults. And uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, leave a, a like or a comment below. Let us know. If you didn't enjoy it, uh, let us know. If you have any suggestions or requests, by all means, let us know. And have a wonderful rest of your evening.